Good morning, everybody. So we are going to start this uh, this webinar now. Uh, so on behalf of BDBE and, and Databox projects, welcome to this webinar. I hope that, that uh, all of you are doing well. So today we have uh, the pleasure of having four speakers from Databolts, uh, or one of the BDB PPP personal data platforms projects. Uh, they are going to present a very interesting and challenging aspects related uh, to personal data sharing, such as, for instance, uh, privacy, ethics, GDPR, intellectual property rights, data ownership and control, compensation schemas, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So we will hear a very very interesting facts about personal data sharing. But before I give uh, the floor to, uh, to our speakers, allow me to say a few words about the logistic of these webinars. So first, uh, if you're interested in, in these topics, in data-related topics and AI, go regularly to our webinar webpage that is shown uh, at the bottom of this slide. In these two URLs, you will find more information about future and past webinars. And in the past webinars, you will find the, the links to, to, the, to the recordings and to the slides. Once we record, because this webinar is being recorded, uh, once we record this webinar, we will up, up, upload this uh, recording to, to the past webinar URL that you have at, at the bottom. Regarding the questions, uh, please, uh, if you have any questions, write them in the question chat that you have available through the tool. And at the end of the presentations, I will I will read them, read them and, and ask the, the speakers to answer your questions. Uh, right after the end of the webinar, you will be directed to a very brief survey uh, to get to know your feedback uh, about the webinar and recommendation. But now I'm going to, to launch a couple of uh, short questions for, for you uh, in, in the form of a poll. So let me just uh, go a second to the webinar if I can and try to, to raise the, the poll for so one second. I'm having troubles with the poll. It's not launching. So let, let's skip the poll for now. Maybe if uh, at the end of the webinar I have the time, I will come back to that. So basically, this is it. Uh, le let me present you uh, the a brief agenda and the speakers. So first of all, we have uh, Juri Glickman, which is Deputy Director of the Digital Public Service Department at the Fraunhofer Focus in Germany and is the coordinator of the Databolts project. Yuri is going to provide an overview of the challenges of personal data sharing and the approach followed in Databolts. After Yuri, Sotiris Kousuris, Managing Director of Suite 5 in Cyprus, will present the main building blocks uh, for ensuring privacy, security, and trust, as well as uh, the necessary infrastructure to enable compensation and fair distribution of data. We have uh, after uh, after after Sotidis, uh, Thanasis Gianetsos, which is an associate professor at the Technical University of Denmark, and Marina Tabormida, uh, which is a research and innovation lawyer and ethics expert at ETA Italy. Um, both will introduce uh, key aspects about trust, ethics, and the application of uh, the, the GDPR in personal data sharing. So, without uh, further delay, let me hand over to to Yuri. Uh, so, Yuri, I'm giving you in a second the presentation rights. So, one second. I'm changing you to the presenter to you. So, you will be able to share your screen. So, Yuri, the floor is yours now. Okay, thank you, Thomas. Um, can you see my screen? Yes. Wonderful. Um, so thank you, first of all, to BDVA for, for inviting us uh, and giving this opportunity to make uh, these presentations uh, for all of you. It's our pleasure. I'm Yuri Glickman from Fraunhofer Focus, and uh, I'm coordinator of this project. I will provide you a short overview about <clears throat> well, overall problematic and about the concept of the project. And my colleagues, they will present in more detail about technical, security, and ethics aspects of, uh, of the issues with which we are dealing. So, one second. 
yeah so personal data value so personal data and usage of personal data our days it's it's a kind of hot topic uh, people uh, do a lot of about it and talk about it but in reality it's it's not actually new so since a long time uh, different uh, companies or governments politicians and uh, uh, different economic operators had strong interest to, 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 to get personal data and use it. And uh, sometimes we were misusing it, as we all know. And uh, the motto, know your customer, uh, worked uh, before and it works now even more because it gives the basis for new, more innovative and better services or for some not so good companies to sell their not so high quality products uh, uh, to, to customers uh, by just uh, basically misusing the, the data of customers in a bad way. And, uh, uh, but uh, in general, it gives a lot of opportunities for a better quality services, more personalized, all services which are trying to be not kind of a mass production uh, services, but uh, something specialized for the customer needs, what customer has uh, in, in mind. Uh, to to implement it and uh, provide it basically and it's uh, very important also for investors to know uh, before we invest actually and to, to better assess if it, a certain service or a new product has a chance on the market and for that where of course the opinion of uh, potential customers is very important and what we see now what uh, tons of data is generated uh, what are different sources of data. Uh, some of these data, what we call personal data, but some other data is just uh, maybe not necessarily personal, but generated by, by uh, end users and uh, can be provided by end users. And uh, this brings to creation of new products. And on our side, these new products uh, like sensors, wearables, IoT devices and CPS devices, they, they, uh, they generate new, basically even more data. And we see what we have now a lot of devices, uh, which names are starting with word smart. All these uh, devices are already generating data and sharing this data. Uh, and uh, the market is huge, there is no concrete, uh, let's say, a kind of uh, exact uh, uh, value of this market. So it's not unknown, but there are different estimations. And uh, one of them is uh, estimates what uh, at least with uh, total value of, 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 of data, it's approximately about 210 billion uh, dollars. So, and actually it's even now for sure more and it's growing. If you look on the success stories of uh, current giant companies like Facebook or Google, which started some years ago from, from, from scratch, basically. You see how big they became based on the personal data of, of people. And uh, we see now more and more such companies trying to, to, to use the data of people. And uh, on the other side, people uh, were concerned about that. So only 15% of people actually feel what they have control over their data. At the same time, we have a new generation of people, so-called millennials, between 16 and 34 years old. They see, of course, where what they get something for, for this sharing of data, or they potentially can have something. They can get the better services, and uh, uh, or maybe we would like to get some uh, monetary benefits, but actually not necessarily financial. So we, we see benefits and we see advantage, of course, in all these smart services, but still we want to have a certain guarantee regarding privacy, security, and this is very important for them. So in general, there is a, a willingness, but uh, there is a strong lack of trust. And privacy and security aspects are extremely important. And this is why it's also important to uh, regulate uh, these issues regarding usage of personal data. And uh, we are all glad what the European Commission and uh, 
European Parliament are taking measures to address this issue, and we have already GDPR and uh, some other regulations which are extremely important, which create a legal basis for solving such issue and for managing such issues. And technical systems uh, will will come. Apart from uh, legal issues, there are also many ethical uh, issues which are not necessary. Uh, maybe defined in the laws, but still should be respected, and it's part of our today webinar as well. So Marina will will talk about that. So it's very important to don't forget forget about ethics. And uh, at the moment, uh, uh, people even if we're uh, only 15 of them, uh, basically feel uh, what we control their data. In reality, uh, people don't control their data. Where the data is already more or less uh, is uh, under control of different service providers. So when you use uh, anything what is called smart, in most cases, if this device is connected to internet, it means your data is somehow goes somewhere. If you have a smart TV, then uh, basically the company uh, TV uh, uh, which produced TV knows about your preferences, what you are watching, when, and so on. And similar, if you have a kind of bonus card in a certain supermarket and buy something and get a kind of very small discount from them, they know exactly what you are buying and they can bill and profile you. So it's 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 clear what we are collecting this data for optimization purposes and also for uh, for knowing what we can offer, what kind of products could be interesting for you, but you are not getting actually uh, a fair amount of uh, value back. Yeah. On our side, uh, uh, if you build a system where the user gets the control over data and uh, uh, basically provides the permission for every data usage, it brings, of course, the complexity. So it's always, uh, and the user can quickly get tired of uh, such a requests. So it's always uh, kind of. Uh, uh, when you when someone wants to build such a system, you should always consider how to do it comfortable for the end user. So the user don't uh, lose interest in, uh, in giving such permissions, or on the other side, will not just uh, will give a general permission to use uh, its data uh, in any possible way. So it should be a very clever concept how it should be done. Um, yes. So in uh, our, this is what we are going to address in our data votes project. So on one side, we want to, to let data owners, to, which are individuals, private persons, to decide what, how much, in which manner, and how, for how long they give their data away and to whom. So to, for which purpose? So we want to give them this possibility. On our side, of course, it should be the we need to guarantee privacy and the security of their data because the trust is something that's very difficult to establish but it will can be very easily lost in, in case of mistakes especially in, in, uh, at, uh, in current media world when there is a certain scandal with like Cambridge Analytics or with uh, any other company it's, uh, it provides uh, a, a lot of kind of uh, 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 let's say the trust is lost after that. So this is a kind of issue. And what we want to do is to retrieve a fair share of value to the data generators. So we so we users first of all uh, get something for for their sharing, and also get uh, will be more interested to share their data. So it does not mean what they are receiving should receive certain monetary prizes, not necessary, but they should be benefited from sharing data. And these uh, benefits should be, uh, let's say, fair compared to what we are providing. This is important. And a few words about our projects. Uh, so it's a Horizon 2020 project uh, from the topic uh, uh, ICT 13, supporting the emergence of data markets and the data economy. It's a relative big project with 70 partners for three years. We started in January uh, this year, and uh, it's innovation action. We have five demonstrators. I will say a few words more about it. 
And we have different art of partners in the consortium. We have data providers, of course. Uh, we have experts for data management and sharing, like, like us. We have security and privacy experts. And we also have data analytics experts in the consortium, what allow us to build such a complex solution for our end user. And our vision of what we are trying to build is to define and build a, a platform, or define a framework and build a platform which would enable secure, trusted, and privacy preserving mechanism to enable the individuals to take ownership and control of their data and share them at will through flexible data sharing and fair compensation schemes with other entities. So it should be something very pragmatic and easy to use for the end user, which would allow them to integrate existing in, in their environment data sources and share this data if they find it interesting for them for, for the uh, consumers of the data. On one side, we address such individuals which have data, and on another side, we address organizations which are interested or would be interested actually to get access to such data for a certain purpose, maybe for research, maybe for commercial studies, or maybe for something else. Uh, but uh, uh, it's important what what is the transparency here for what and for how long and how a data is going to use. And of course, it needs to be uh, uh, in conformance with the legislation. So we have two type of actors in our platform which we are developing. So one side we have data providers which come, which should be able to extract, collect their data to manage them somehow in a better and uh, efficient and simple for them way. And it should be possible for them to relatively simply share this data without too much efforts. Because if a user, let's say, will uh, need to take too much effort to, for sharing the data and uh, will get for that very small benefit, I don't know, like one cent or discount of, I don't know, one five cents or something, when nobody will do it. So it, it needs to be somehow very simple and very convenient for the data providers. On the other side, we have data requesters which are potentially interested for the data or they are actually very much interested to get such data, but they need to get data in certain quality, they want to get data, uh, uh, let's say, well described, and they need to be able to find this data and uh, to come in agreement with the uh, data providers about the data usage. Uh, so what we can share, uh, we are at the moment we are thinking about uh, three different types of, let's say, assets which can be shared. On one side, of course, it's just raw data, or which can be shared by the data providers, and uh, and uh, of course, uh, sharing raw data is always kind of a risk for privacy, and uh, it's, uh, it's the most maybe the most interesting uh, data for for the end user, or not for the end user, but for data. Uh, analytics companies. At the same time, of course, it means a huge amount of data, which maybe for them it's not a main issue, but it brings additional challenges, let's say. On our side, we are thinking to, instead of sharing the data, just share some data, data analytics, which may provide maybe the same uh, accuracy or answer the questions which, uh, which certain companies or economic players have but without uh, putting under any possible risk of uh, privacy of individuals. And we are thinking about complex insights when there is a combination of different analytics, uh, which makes uh, the uh, individuals even more anonymous and uh, completely not identifiable. So in all cases, they should be non-identifiable actually. Uh, or they, they explicitly need to agree to that if they want to, to remain identifiable. Okay, in the project, we have five demonstrators of very different art and very interesting. The first one is about the sport club. You all know the famous Olympiakos sport club in Greece. It's uh, our partner in the first demonstrator about sport and activity of uh, personal data. 
uh, where I want to provide the better services to members of the club, which is very big organization. And second one, it's about it's from public uh, sector in uh, with the city Piraeus about uh, strengthening entrepreneurship and mobility in the city. The third one, it's very interesting pilot with uh, innovative SME company in Belgium, Andaman 7, which, which already works with personal data. It enables the users to manage to get and manage their, their health records. And, uh, and uh, we are going to make a, a, a pilot with them and help them to make their product, which is already very successful, even better. And uh, the top one, it's about smart energy uh, with a partner, you know, Energy from, from, from Spain. It's about smart home personal energy data. And the fifth one, a personal data for municipal services and tourism, also with municipality, with city Prato. So these five demonstrators which, uh, will enable us to, to test our uh, technology in uh, different domains and also with different types of scenario challenges and also different legislations under different legislations of national countries. So there are a lot of challenges here, so technical challenges, uh, secure, uh, ethical challenges and of course uh, uh, security challenges are also very critical. And my colleagues will present them now in more detail. So I'm giving work now to, to the scientific coordinator uh, of a project, Dr. Satirius Kosuris from Suit5 company. Please, Satiris. What is yours? Satiris, so I think you are muted. And yes, okay, thank you, Yuri. I hope you can see and hear me right now, and I'm going to share my screen. OK, uh, thank you very much. Uh, as Yuri said, uh, my name is Sotiris, and I work for Suite 5, which is the scientific coordinator of the Data Vaults project. And uh, I'm delighted to be here today in this webinar to talk to you about how we can enable such a trusted and privacy preserving personal data marketplace with uh, technological components. But uh, let me begin first by uh, posing an open question. So would anybody of you uh, be, let's say, comfortable to leave your wallet on display unattended in a public bar? Uh, a wallet that might contain not only money, but could have also credit cards, uh, IDs, social security numbers, family photos, or whatever you keep in your wallet. So obviously the, quest, the answer here to this question is no. And if you think about personal data, you have to be sure that it's quite more important than just a wallet. Actually, this is data that might contain both financial as well as private life information and data that is quite crucial to be kept uh, secure and secret and not exploited without the consent of the rightful owner, so the consent of the individual. And therefore, we see that security and privacy is of utmost importance when it comes to personal data. And when you go out, you can see various types of regulations, GDPR or whatever, that point exactly out the importance of uh, this data. Uh, regulations and laws and norms which are available in every country, every state, and even in every continent. Of course, this does not mean that uh, personal data is not to be shared. Uh, it should be shared and could be shared. However, the one that is in possession of personal data, the primary owner of the data, should be the one that should control how this is shared, with whom, and so on, and is the one that should actually enjoy benefits, which has not happened uh, so far. And when we talk about sharing data, uh, we have seen different types of uh, managing data and sharing data uh, that have different, different impact on dimensions uh, of how data is uh, used. When, for example, we talk about analytics, how data is valued, 
and so on. So just to give you an example, uh, there are many different platforms or tools that uh, allow data to be uh, shared anonymously or uh, through uh, proper anonymization techniques. Data could reside at the edge or could be centralized, stored in a cloud and so on. And all these decisions have an impact on things like the security and the privacy levels, how much we can get out of analytics and eventually how much uh, the data is valued. Just to give you some brief examples, when we talk about having data at the edge, so close to the individual, we see that, for example, we might score quite high when it comes to security and privacy. However, when it comes to analytics performance, uh, this is quite a, a medium score. Uh, probably because in such cases, the uh, resources that are available to an individual are quite limited. On the same page, when we talk about sharing data in an unencrypted manner, we see that possibly uh, there is quite a low uh, security level because anybody would uh, potentially be able to get uh, their hands on that data. However, uh, analytics accuracy might be quite higher and the data could be much more viable if it's treated in an unencrypted uh, format. So having all these uh, impacts that we see in this table, which is just an example, uh, what uh, personal data marketplaces should do, and actually applications that work on this domain, is to find a golden line that would allow uh, to have a high value of the data, and at the same time keeping security and privacy level as high as possible. Uh, on the same page, uh, the same should go on with trust. So there should be trust guarantees, and this is quite important as well, uh, even, even more, because as you all know, trust is built piece by piece, but when things go bad, it's destroyed instantly and totally. It's what they say that when the glass is broken, it can never be uh, glued back together. So when people share data, individuals, as we call, uh, call them, they need to trust the platform that they provide the data to. They need to trust the platform that uh, it will actually um, respect the SLAs it provides them. It will actually be secure and will do uh, nothing more than what was initially agreed to do on the data. And on the other side, the data seekers, the organizations that are seeking this data and need to get intelligence out of this data, need to trust the platform that the information that it provides them is valuable so that they can go on and continue their operations uh, on the platform and with the data that is offered uh, for the platform. So, okay, th those are some theoretical things that we have to have in mind when we have to uh, discuss about uh, how we can, uh, how, what we should consider when building uh, such a such a platform. And let's turn our attention now to what we could actually offer to an individual in order to ensure that uh, what they do over such a marketplace or, or such a platform is uh, according to those considerations that we seen before. So first of all, what we have found out is that assets need to need to be collected by the individual. Uh, the assets should, uh, let's say, be retrieved by the, an individual commanding such an action. And therefore, in, in our, let's say, approach, we are talking about an infrastructure, part of an infrastructure that is called a personal data vault. So a system that resides close to the individual in his home, in his uh, uh, smartphone, uh, on a setup uh, box or whatever. Once data is collected, it needs also to be stored at the same site initially. So we're talking about having there some databases in that personal data vault, which are able to uh, store the data, of course, in a secure and uh, encrypted state in order uh, to guarantee maximum security, even if this uh, personal vault, let's say, is compromised. Then it comes to sharing the data. So the individual should have control on things like when to share the data, what to share, 
does he share analytics? Does he share the data, as you mentioned before? Does he want to share insights? How to share this data? Should the data be shared anonymously in an encrypted state or so on? Then decide with whom to share the data and, of course, under which conditions, which are the licenses, what is the price and so on. So in that box, another key component is what we could call a sharing configurator that should uh, actually have modules that define uh, all the operations that should come uh, out of these bullets, like uh, setting access policies, anonymizing the data if the individual chooses so, uh, keeping track of what kind of anonymization has been done, mm -hmm. uh, appending licenses and uh, similar information and price to that data, and so on. Of course, prior to sharing any kind of data, the individual should also, and this is quite important and is not there uh, in the market, in any kind of this platform, should, should be aware of the risk uh, he's exposed to if he's going to share a specific data set. Not only based on the information of the data set, but also on information he has previously shared uh, over such a platform, which, if, let's say, correlated with the information he's about to share, could reveal uh, many things about uh, his private life or uh, his finances or whatever. So a privacy metrics, let's say, dashboard or monitor should come in place and the individual should be aware, uh, in any case, uh, of the risk he's exposed to or if he is going to actually share uh, some kind of data. And finally, there should be a way to ensure trust both uh, from the side of the individual and from the platform in terms of the individual trusting that the platform he's uploading the uh, data is actually the one that uh, should be and is not compromised or is not behaving badly but at the same time the platform should also trust that the data uh, it is receiving from the individual are actually trustworthy and coming from a trusted device and not from somebody that has infiltrated the network and uploads uh, data uh, on behalf of that in, uh, account. So we need to have an attestation module in place, which are provided in various formats. We have a hardware attestation using TPMs, we have software attestation and uh, so on. At the same side, uh, on the other side, we should also think about what is necessary uh, for, uh, for the data seeker. So again, we should get, cater for one access point for all so that everybody who is willing to acquire some kind of data in that marketplace has a single point uh, of, of entry and operation. So therefore, it is essential to have a cloud-based infrastructure, what we call here a, that cloud-based data vault infrastructure, where uh, economic operators can access through uh, web access or APIs or whatever. Data that resides on the platform, so that is shared on the platform, should be searchable and if possibly searchable, even if it, this is encrypted. So we're talking about having the uh, components like a query builder and the data explorer that can go on and search for metadata of the shared and uploaded data in order to identify what is of interest and what can be acquired. Uh, there are secure storage spaces where this data uh, is uh, residing and of course uh, we should also think of an encrypted searchable data lake where operations can be performed over the encrypted data that might reveal to a data seeker uh, whether a data set is of interest and of value for him without actually disclosing the full contents of it. Then access to those data sets should be quite simply simple and apply to newcomers meaning that once an individual shares a data set he should probably not share it with a specific organization but should actually have in mind to share it with a, a domain or a sector and so on so a, a, a access can be based on attributes and there is where the an access policy engine and a module 
uh, like attribute based uh, encryption could be uh, uh, could come in place and play this role of allowing access to uh, those uh, organizations and finally the data that is uploaded in that platform or they on or let's say acquired and the analytics that should happen over that platform should be performed in secure containers so secure playgrounds as we call them in our project where uh, the data seeker is trusting the platform that his data will not leak and nobody else will have access of course this uh, these two let's say big uh, parts of uh, our architecture uh, miss one great thing which is how we uh, allow monetization to, to to happen and how we compensate data owners for their assets so in order to do that what we are uh, working on is a double permissive ledger approach where on the one hand you have a data seeker that conducts some contracts with the data vaults platform and then the platform once the, those contracts are validated uh, signs another contract with the data owner in that sense there is no direct in direct interaction between data seekers and data owners privacy uh, is uh, fully kept and actually the, there is the an intermediate uh, which is the platform that takes over the uh, let's say value flow from one side to the other so this is based on a blockchain infrastructure as you can see here which is not only used for uh, monetization and money flow but it's also an environment that uh, is able to uh, safeguard transactions and act as a reference point for access control and pass and record the past actions that have happened also on our platform so this if glued together with some other components constitutes our data vault architecture and you can visit us and have a, a look at this architecture figure and uh, what we are developing uh, in our website uh, we expect to have a test prototype uh, by summer and uh, just to, to, to highlight what uh, we have seen today is that uh, the way to move on is that there are ways to let data providers control what, how, how much and in which manner they share and guarantee their trust and privacy and in the same time in the same uh, in the same moment uh, allow to have to get back a fair share of the value that they create. Technologies are already there. We can uh, see stuff like TPM attestation, attribute-based control, attribute-based encryption, and so on. And uh, we don't have to reinvent the wheel. Uh, the, the idea is to choose out of a bunch of modules that are there, integrate them together, and provide all those benefits to uh, the different stakeholders of this uh, uh, data chain. So that uh, will be all from me. Thank you very much for your attention. And uh, I will give the floor now to my colleague, uh, Dr. Thanasis Yanetsos from uh, DTU to take us more on the security uh, side. So Thanasi, I think you are now in charge. Thank you. Can you see my screen? Yes, yes, yes. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon also from my side. Uh, it's very nice to start talking uh, about uh, our project and also put it in the context of, of, of the more general vision of uh, what we're trying to achieve. Trying to also to accommodate the time that we have allocated for the seminar. Uh, my goal is that to actually elaborate at a high level and in a very quick way, a very brief overview of what we are talking about when we refer to security, privacy requirements, trust requirements. So this actually gave a very nice overview of the different building blocks that are out there. And they are actually being worked on by different industry standards, standardization bodies, various working groups. But the overall plan and what is missing is how to actually put them all together to be able to work correctly in order to achieve the requirements we want to achieve. So just as a reminder, when it comes to the project, now what we are trying to achieve is aligned with the general vision from the EU 
that we are moving towards more advanced data sharing economies. And this is driven not only by what is the focus of the data was project, which is basically refers to the sharing of personal data, but with the rise also of Internet of Things, and we are having so much, so many uh, sensors deployed. So we have like smart cities, smart uh, homes, and so on and so forth. We have a huge unprecedented quantity of data that on one hand, it's very good because this can allow us actually to make much better decisions. On the other hand, when shared, these have very strict security, privacy, and trust requirements. Especially in the context of personal data sharing, the users needs to be convinced that their data will not be will not be used for a malevolent purpose uh, other than what has been agreed otherwise they will opt out from actually using uh, the system and this again goes beyond the, the data watch platform this is the general consensus that we need to give much higher guarantees to the users that their data will be used correctly this also aligns with the current vision that we need to basically shift a little bit of the trust from what happens in the backend infrastructure closer to that, closer to the users. So the users need to also be able to not completely control, but provide input that will dictate of how the data is going to be used. And they expect back that the provision of verifiable evidence that what has been agreed is actually why their data has been used. And in this context, as also Sotiris mentioned, of course, we have the use of blockchains that are transforming the way that we can actually perform transactions uh, in the cyberspace. So they are actually performing a very nice starting point for being able to have uh, all of the, uh, the necessary accountability when it comes to transactions and when it comes to that data shared uh, with the framework or other third party application and service, pro and service providers, everything can actually be recorded on the blockchain or the distributed ledgers and can be verified and ratified by multiple entities and other stakeholders. Now, one main question in this case is that the way that the blockchain was initially envisioned was not so much with security and privacy in mind. Now, everything, all of the transactions are being recorded on the blockchain. Okay, so it's more important to have this type of accountability and the type of transparency that everyone can see what has happened and what has taken place. Now, this is a bit of a contradicting if we also consider that yes, we need to be able to have this accountability sharing of data, but as it has been highlighted, it's very, very important to be able to have very strong security and privacy requirements. And now when we are talking about security and privacy requirements, this goes beyond the traditional ones like confidentiality of the data. So having encryption and uh, when sharing potentially different levels of encryption, when we want to share it with different types of uh, third party service providers when we're talking about data integrity or when we're talking about availability so these are the traditional requirements that a lot of things have actually been done to be able to tackle them we are going beyond those things and we're talking about uh, authorization access control privacy both for the user identities but also for the data perspective we are talking about forward to backward privacy and secrecy meaning that when something has been shared, a transaction has been made by a user when it comes to sharing the data, if something happens in the framework and something, a key or another secret gets compromised, this will not affect all of the transactions that have already taken place or that will take place in the future. And another important thing here is that the privacy itself also has some contradicting aspects. So again, on one hand, we need to be able to protect the identity privacy also of the users and when it comes to the privacy of the SR data. But on the other hand, when something goes wrong, so potentially we also have malicious users, malicious actors, that they will try to exploit this inherent privacy to be able to provide fake data or own data. So in this case, we need to also have strong mechanisms of being able to be anonymizing the users and revoking, for instance, the credentials of how to be able to participate in such a system. 
So this problem of, of privacy preserving revocation, it is an open challenge in many application domains, especially when it comes to personal data sharing, uh, which has not been completely solved. There are different techniques being proposed. And it's something that it's also one of the core aspects that we are also looking in the context of the project. And as you can see from the, from the last bullet points, what we are also working on is trying to put everything together and to actually integrate the blockchain technologies with other emerging technologies in the domain of security and privacy to be able to create these decentralized blockchain-based trust anchors. And the main idea behind this is to actually use trusted computing technologies where basically they are allowing to shift most of the trust in the edge in the user's hand. Uh, and they are actually can control through trusted components, a most prominent one can actually be the trusted buffer module, of what happens when they are uploading and sharing the information on the data vaults framework uh, to then be shared with other third party uh, service providers. So from our side, we have classified, and this is also well aligned to what has been done in the industry and by various standardization groups into five main elements. So basically one aspect is on governance, which means that there needs to be well-defined set of standards and policies of who can access the data, who can manage the data, how new members can actually be securely enrolled, what happens with the management of secrets and keys that are going to be to, to control the, the access to the data, and so on and so forth. So this type of policies, they should actually be driven by the privacy preferences and the security preferences of the users themselves. Okay. And this is also in alignment with how we are applying this type of policies through the integration of smart contracts. So a smart contracts can actually be in practice that will regulate how the data are going to be shared and are going to be used by the third party service providers. This also allow, allow us to con not control, but try to take into consideration another very important uh, aspect, which is fairness. Of course, fairness has a lot of different, uh, different aspects to consider. In our case, when we're talking about fairness, one very important thing is that the users are not trying to manipulate how the data is uploaded in order to be able to get uh, reimbursed without actually providing what is needed. There are also different aspects of fairness and there was a very interesting question that was posed is that how do we make sure in such an economy that what the user is provided is correctly compensated by a third party uh, service provider. But actually, this is also what is the meaning of creating such a marketplace for the vision of, of data sharing economy. So the user will also be able to accept different requests and they can choose what is the best suited for them when it comes to sharing the data. Another important thing as, as, as a main pillar is when we are talking about data security and privacy. And this is where we are going beyond, as we said, the simple confidentiality, data integrity primitives, but we are going to more advanced technologies that are based on trusted computing, on trusted components. And we are investigating how to integrate uh, the blockchains together with more advanced algorithms like uh, direct anonymous attestation, which is for creating very strong privacy preserving primitives to be used by the users when uploading the data. We also have like more straightforward solutions like attribute-based encryption and so on and so forth. The difficult part here, the tricky part, is how again to glue them all together to work correctly for achieving the necessary requirements. We also have the correctness of the transactions. So when a transaction is uploaded on the, the ledger, uh, there needs to be a consensus algorithm that can be used by the verifying peers, the verifying nodes, that this transaction was executed correctly. And last but not least, and this is something which is usually overlooked when it comes to blockchains, is the endpoint vulnerabilities. So we have now the users that will also access the blockchain. We have the third party service providers that will also access the blockchain. So this can provide a lot of different types of points of intrusion 
if we are talking about the blockchain wallet used in a mobile application or like even in a, in a computing system. So we have to be able to make sure that yes, we give a lot of freedom and privilege to the users, but we are also trying to minimize the attack surface that can be potentially exploited at this endpoint. And this is where you can see on the right side. Uh, sorry to interrupt, but we, you have one more minute because we are running out of time. Yes, sorry. it's basically my last slide. Uh, you can see here on the right side uh, a summary of the various technologies that are going to be investigated in the context of, uh, of the blockchain, against ranging from identity and access management, the use of smart contracts. We also have vulnerability and risk assessment, and we have the integration of various crypto primitives for encryption, uh, trust, and so on and so forth. And again, the important thing is how to actually put them all together. And one last thing is that one important aspect that we're always taking into consideration is how to be able to align them with what has been investigated in the standards. So data voice is also represented in the ISO standards, which is the main driving force that is working about security and privacy and identity management in blockchains. Especially the TC307 working groups where they are focusing in security essentials, risk reduction, and other type of benefits when it comes to assessing the security of blockchains. So it's also one of our main goals that the research and the type of new models that we are going to define in the context of the project, that these are going to be presented and potentially be pushed as a new consideration in the ISO technical specifications. And this was it from my side. Thank you very much. I will quickly now give the uh, floor to uh, Marina. Okay, thank you. Uh, good afternoon to, to everyone. And um, thank you to Thomas uh, for the invitation to this uh, webinar. I'm very pleased uh, to be here. Uh, I am uh, turn on your camera. Thank you. Ah, yes, sorry, sorry. Uh, okay. Right. Um, I am a lawyer specialized in IT development and uh, an ethics expert serving uh, for many European projects uh, since many years. And today, uh, I'm, I'm here to, to briefly introduce you um, with uh, some GDPR and data ethics consideration uh, in personal data sharing, in particular, our addressing these topics in our project. GDPR, application and ethics issues are really at the core of our work plan. We have several uh, um, tasks and uh, uh, in which these uh, elements are, uh, are described and are involved. At the beginning of the project, we, um, we provided uh, a legal and ethical reference framework for starting the, the operation. And in particular, this was focused on uh, um, the data protection law, on GDPR in particular at European level, and on national data protection legislation. But we also investigated human rights law and ethics and soft law which is really an important instrument uh, given its flexible nature um, capable of filling the gaps of, uh, of the regulatory instrument. In the next month, uh, we plan to enlarge and extend this reference framework by addressing additional pieces of, um, of legislation, in particular um, the law on trust services, identification and authentication, with uh, um, the uh, investigation of the potential impact of ADAS directive and uh, the Data Governance Act and so on and so forth. We believe uh, that uh, in our project it is uh, really essential to foster a citizen-centric vision. Uh, and it is uh, a transversal topic of uh, our research because it is uh, the way uh, which allows us to operationalize our ethical approach. 
and also uh, to move uh, uh, towards uh, uh, trust building and so also to improve the acceptance uh, of data vault technology and foster the sustainability of its solutions. And this is aligned with the European vision and with the priorities of many uh, initiatives and movements and is able of uh, um, increasing the amounts of uh, uh, personal data available. So it, it is really the, a pillar of our, uh, our vision. Taking into account this uh, citizen-centric approach, we developed the um, specific uh, data vault uh, approach, which is uh, based on three main pillars. The first is uh, ethics and fairness, uh, with many um, dimensions, such as loyalty, good faith, um, the need to avoid any adverse impact on, um, on, um, on individuals. The second pillar is the sharing the wealth paradigm. And uh, uh, it is uh, um, the way in which we can uh, um, foster a win-win data sharing ecosystem. Uh, my colleagues before me uh, described this very well, uh, and it is uh, capable of unlocking the social value of personal data, and so also to be aligned with social need expectation. The last pillar is the privacy and security by design and by default approach, which has been enriched with the protection goal method. This, uh, um, this approach was used not only to develop the ethical policy of the project, but it was essential in the elicitation of the legal and ethical requirements, uh, which are guiding the technical developers uh, to, um, in, their, in their work. Uh, this requirement uh, will also um, be uh, relevant in the validation of data vault technology. They are of different nature. We have uh, sometimes only recommendations and uh, um, they are accompanied by a, a set of uh, insights and guidelines which are uh, seen as uh, um, a source of help uh, in implementing uh, this uh, uh, requirement. We have no time to, to go into details on each of them, but we can just uh, add some example. One of these is uh, the risk-based approach, which is a pillar in GDPR, which is mentioned several times, and which ask for adequate measure uh, in relation to the risk to data protection and also ask for an objective assessment of the risk. In Data Vault, we have a supporting tool um, which is uh, really innovative and which will be developed in the upcoming months, which is the privacy metric dashboard. And it, is, uh, it will be conceived for raise the awareness of the individual on the private exposure impact of sharing data assets. And uh, it will also be based on um, specific and objective metrics, and so in compliance with GDPR, and will also um, give rise to notification to the individual of the risk exposure and of the update of this uh, uh, level of risk. Uh, we think that it is really a powerful tool, not only for accountability, but also for other requirements such as user consent and uh, informed consent, sorry, and user control. Another, uh, another requirement refers uh, to informed consent, and also in this case, uh, we have multiple challenges to be addressed. Uh, and as Yuri mentioned, we, uh, we need to have uh, something that is um, 
easy to use for the for the user for the individual and so we need to avoid that the constant fatigue with respective gdpr provisions and national legislation um, several approaches are under exploration such as the one uh, fostered by article 29 working party the, the layered approach the granularity of the consent and uh, um, in the personal app of data vault all this will be embedded uh, for instance uh, through the sharing configuration model another uh, important requirement is the need to have a user interface really user and data protection friendly and uh, capable of supporting uh, different actions such as managing the consent exercise data subject rights data portability and so on and so forth or the features that enable user control and the ownership over personal data. The way forward, in the next uh, months, we plan to enrich the legal survey to uh, further analyze the, the progress of the technology and to enrich on this basis the legal requirement. With continuing the cross fertilization between the different work packages and above all, as we mentioned, to capture the citizen perspective on the different uh, topics, uh, on the, their perception, doubt, concern, and their openness to use a system like Data Vault for data sharing, and to make synergy with initiatives which have this uh, citizen centric approach at the core, like Data Vault. Okay, it's all for my side. Thank you. Thank you very much, Martina. I think we are a bit uh, out of time, but I think there are, there are a couple of questions that uh, I think we can take anyway. So uh, I'm going to read aloud the questions posed in the in the question chat. Uh, the first one is: uh, Is uh, you seem to expect that people can make a proper judgment on giving their data in return from getting value, but when companies are continuously obscuring how they will use uh, our data? Can a person be realistically expected to understand and properly make this bargain? Is the power asymmetry between the individuals and the company not too large to ensure a fair deal between both parties? And how is this fundamentally di different from the bargain that was we already make on a daily basis? So for instance, so we can use uh, Google or Facebook for free as long as they use our data. So this is a long question, but I hope that uh, someone uh, can take it from the panelists. I would like to answer it. Um, actually, I like your question very much, and uh, it's a very interesting question for discussion. Um, in short, uh, I think, um, indeed, uh, uh, of course, this inequality between uh, individuals and huge companies uh, in, in the near future will remain uh, as in uh, any other aspects of your life uh, where you it's very difficult uh, for in individual to fight against a big company definitely and uh, but i think a way to 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 get um, uh, basically where, um, to make it uh, let's say a fair uh, kind of a uh, price let's say or price not necessarily monetary but fair value get back is to increase the competition and make a more transparent market when you have more service offering and also data offering and when uh, and uh, data providers they know for what we are providing data and how data is going to be used and we can take it when we decision so we are get, we get asked and um this is the only way how I see it. I don't think what it can be somehow solved with the help of a kind of legal regulation so easily. I believe Thank in the market. <laughs> Thank you, Yuri. And I think the second question is precisely related to the market because uh, it's about uh, if the market is always the answer to this type of thing. So the question uh, reads as, uh, yeah, that we in the project have a, a very strong focus on individual benefits. So I give my data and then I get an exciting return. But uh, the doubt is if it's the more reasonable thing to expect. Uh, is uh, only this market friendly and individualistic perspective the more suitable? So what do you think? 
Yeah, so um, maybe I also, when I was presenting it, I maybe did it not very well. Um, in a sense, what um, it's not just focused on individual value uh, for for individuals. Uh, in a sense, on personal value, it's just uh, or monetized value, not at all. And it's not like this individual will get necessary somehow insight because this individual shared the data. So it can be, but not necessary. Basically, the individual needs to be uh, motivated to share the data. So, for example, if a certain company comes and say, I want to do certain studies and I would like to get your health data for that in anonymized form, for example, or maybe not. And if we explain how we want to use my data and for what, which purpose, I can decide if I give them for free or, or, or not at all. Uh, this will be my decision. Not necessarily I'm, I'm, I'm going to ask for money or something or special insights about my personal health. Not, not necessary. So it's, it's not the case. But we want to create this, give this opportunity to do that. So to make offer and also request for data and establish this market, let's say, or support establishment of a market. Thank you very much for your answer. So we don't have more questions in the chat, and I think we are a bit uh, late. So I would like to thank all the presenters today for, for this great presentation. I think we shared some more light on this the difficult thing about data sharing for uh, personal data which is always uh, tricky and also i would like to thank you uh, all the attendees that uh, stayed uh, until now that long and yeah but, but all these uh, as i mentioned at the beginning this is uh, slides and the and the recording will be shared uh, via the big data value website uh, so uh, you will receive tomorrow an email with the with the link to the to the specific place place where, where you can uh, look at this uh, particular webinar so don't you don't need to write it down right now and it will be available in the next few days so we have to to uh, to polish the recording and that's all so we will have it uh, later so thank you very much again and thank you to all and stay stay tuned with the following webinars that will come next year because uh, christmas is uh, the same the landscape is not too far so i will wish you also a happy christmas if we don't have the possibility of uh, of, uh, of having a new webinar before and, and yeah happy new year and stay safe of course thank you very much all. thank you goodbye thomas goodbye thank everyone you. bye bye thank you